Welcome to episode two of the Norton Nemesis 1500cc V8 restoration. And in this video, we should be having a quick look around the bike, removing the engine and removing the cam colors. The Norton Nemesis has a fully enclosed bodywork fairing made from carbon fiber. So this had to be removed first to gain access to the engine underneath. The rear lights are Lucas, similar to fit to an early Land Rover. The engine runs two completely separate radiator systems, one for the front bank and one for the back bank. These are some of the brackets that hold the radiators in place. And there's quite a lot of aluminium tubes and rubber pipes to join up the radiators. And as you can see here, they're quite furred up inside. The exhaust system is basically an 8 into 4 into 2. It's all straight through with no baffles. All the ignition leads and fuel management system sits under the dummy tank cover. The dash has a comprehensive array of dials, but no speedo. The handlebar controls and switches are Suzuki, probably from a TL1000S, they're very similar to the one I used to own. And the front brake still works nice after the repairs I carried out in the previous video. There's quite a bit of internal corrosion in the radiator system. This will clean up nicely. And the throttle linkage needs a bit of work, the springs are rubbing each other. The exhaust system has a fair bit of surface rust, but I'll get these ceramic coated. The water pump has two impellers, one for each radiator system. Moving on to the swing and arm spindle, this is large tubular construction similar to the wheel axles. The starter solenoids from a car are changes from more compact motorcycle starter solenoid. And the back brake still works nicely, which is good, and the wheel turns freely. The front bank of cylinders exhaust system passes through the swing and arm, down underneath the engine and around to the front. It's quite a convoluted route, but it gets there in the end. I thought I'd have a quick look behind me with the right hand side cover to see what's underneath there. And to my surprise, I found that the ignition trigger was completely loose on the end of the crankshaft. One of the screws had fell completely out. In fact, two had fallen out and there's only one left. This was wobbling around all over the place, but the engine still ran. The rear bank exhaust header is virtually impossible to see when it's fitted to the bike. You can just see it in a few places, but I did notice that the gasket was blown like a parcel feeder gauge easily between the cylinder head and the exhaust manifold. It turns out all the screws were loose. There's substantial thinning from the swing and arm spindle down to the back of the engine for stiffness, and underneath there's a conventional screw on oil filter. There are two large holes cut in the frame underneath the headstock spindle to allow air into the air box. This is unfiltered. I'm going to continue the strip by removing the exhaust system, so I loosen off the clamp bolts underneath the swing and arm and slide the two rear pipes off the, off the manifold system. The lower link pipe then slides down through the hole in the swing and arm. It's a tight fit, but it does come out eventually. And here you can see the joint is quite loose. And here's the view looking up from under the swing arm through the hole where the exhaust pipe goes. I look outside and the pigeon is still watching me. It sits in the tree watching me the whole time. The front headers are held to the engine by 12 M5 cap heads. They're quite fiddly to get to but they come out in the end. With the last screw removed the header pipes drop off nicely. And this time there's no evidence of blowing gaskets. Next up I loosen the four screws holding the plate on the top of the engine that holds the ignition coils. This removes nicely from the bike, opening up more space to see what's going on. 
On top of each cam box is a metal welded up steel construction that takes the coolant out of the engine and feeds it back to the radiators. And here you can see the airbox where the injectors inject straight into the inlet ports. These are the oxygen sensor wires, they're not connected because there's no oxygen sensors fitted. With the aluminium plate removed, you can see how close the exhaust manifolds are to the electrical wiring. I'll have to do something about that. I next loosen the screws holding the top of the airbox onto the airbox. This holds all the injection system and wiring and lifts away with one unit. There's quite a lot of wires. I'll be tidying up the wiring when I fit it back to the bike. Some of these wires are way too long and need to be reduced in length. Anyway, here's the induction system now looking down into the engine. You can see it's got rotary valve throttle butterflies, which is really unusual for road vehicles. There's 24 M5 screws and washers holding the airbox onto the engine. These are really fiddly to get to with the Allen key. I can't drop any washers, they'll drop straight down into the engine. It's not too important because I'm going to be taking the engine apart. When I come to put this back together, I'll have to be really careful. One of the strangest things is that the battery sits in the airbox. There's no top cover, so air can leak in all around the battery. You have to be really careful with bits dropping down into the engine, especially if you're doing servicing. With the last screw removed, the magnesium airbox lifts straight away from the engine nicely. And here you can see the eight induction ports and the two inlet ports at the front and the cutaway for the battery. With the airbox removed, I disconnect the throttle cable and look at the throttle linkage. And it seems to hit the engine at the front when it's on full throttle. So you push it right forward and it hits the engine, but the throttle butterflies are only three quarters open, maybe just over a half, which is not ideal for performance, really. But I'd have to have a look at the mechanism, see if I can increase its movement. So now I've got to take the engine out of the bike before I can do any more stripping. The engine's held in with four bolts each side and one massive swing and arm spindle. These are special bolts made from high tensile aluminium. I removed the large castellated nut from the left hand side of the swing and arm spindle and pushed it through as far as I could, but it became a bit tight, so I had to use a hammer gently sliding it along to tap it out. And after several taps, it came out nicely. The nuts are hardened, and there's no damage done to the shaft, and sliding gently. And here it is, out of the bike, the rear engine mounting bolt and swing and arm spindle all in one, and it's massive. I disconnect the rear brake master cylinder from the frame and slide the swing and arm and wheel assembly out of the bike. And check out these large swing and arm spindle bearings, they're huge. And here's the hole for the exhaust. With the swing and arm removed and the last remaining engine bolts undone, the frame can be lifted away from the engine. And here it is, sat on the bench, removed from the bike. Now you can see the rear exhaust manifold with all the soot on the engine where it's been blowing. With the engine out, you can see the design of the bare frame with its internal webbing and strengthening, all cast in aluminium. I've been stripping the bike down at Henry's farm, so now it's time to take the engine back to my garage to do a complete strip of the engine. So I load into my pickup truck and drive home. And when I get home, Tracy's in the kitchen cooking a nice flapjack. This is a healthy eating flapjack with apples and bananas. So first she grates the apple into a plate, puts a bit of butter into the pan, heats up with some peanut butter as well, which looks really nice. Then she adds a bit of honey from the bees. That all dribbles down nicely into the pan, mixes it up with her famous red spoon. And then she adds the apple, banana, and a bit of hot water, which is very strange. Puts it into the pot and stirs it all up with some oats, nuts, raisins, and some berries of some sort. And she adds the mixer to that and stirs it all up. And Charlie Weaver spins invigilating the whole time. He likes to give an arm proceedings in between tipples. And she packs it all down with a red spoon, puts it in the oven, and shuts the door. And that's it for about an hour. And when it comes out, we can't wait to try a bit. So she, first she cuts it into little squares, and then I can take a bit and go back out in the garage and get on with the engine strip. Charlie Weaver is really excited to have the Nemesis engine in the garage to be stripped. 
He's so excited, he had to have three tipples, but then I get straight onto the job. First thing I need to do is to remove the rear exhaust manifold. And this looks really tricky. The screws are almost, almost unreachable, which is probably why they were loose, because they couldn't tighten them up in the first place. So I need to address this when I rebuild the engine. Two top bolts aren't too bad. It's the bottom ones that are really hard. You can just reach with a spanner, do a tiny little bit at a time. That's the outside ones. The inside ones are virtually impossible to get to. It took me ages to get them off. I had to use screwdrivers to flick the heads of the nuts around and tap it gently. Eventually I got them off. Well, that was the hardest part to remove so far, but it's finally off. And look at those gasket surfaces, all split and broken. You can see where it's been blowing for ages. Another strange thing about this bike is it has no charging system. It runs total lost battery. In fact, it had two batteries, one for the starter motor on its own, which I'll be changing. This is a blanking plate where there's a breather at the moment. I'll remove that and fit the proper alternator on if I can. But first, I've got to move the gearbox oil feed pipes. These can certainly be neatened up. They're way too long. And they've got a myriad of different colours of aluminium fittings, all anodised. And this banjo bolt's been reduced from M10 to M8, which significantly reduces its strength. Especially being made of aluminium. Perhaps I'll make one out of stainless steel, that will be stronger. Well, that's your feed pipes removed. And look at this, it's got purple fitting on one end, red fittings on the other end. I can now remove the blanking plate for the alternator. This is held on with three screws and some clamps. The three screws are quite straightforward to remove, and once loosened, I can gently lever the plate away from the engine. That's the last screw and triangle clamp removed. So now I can use my screwdriver and give it a little wiggle, break the gasket, seal the joint, and remove the cover from the engine. Behind the cover, you can see the drive gear for the actual clutch, then the drive gear for the alternator. I next remove this water pump distribution part with the rubber hose. The next thing to remove is the water distribution gantries from the top of the cam covers. These are held on with 12 screws. The screws come undone easily, which is nice, because I thought they might be corroded in, but they're actually okay. With the last screw removed, the gantry lifts off nicely, breaking the seal with the O-rings. This is quite an unusual design, but I guess in reality heat rises to the top, and this is the top of the engine. I then remove the three seal blocks. These seal on top of the engine with O-rings. In between the seal blocks is the four spark plug holes, because contrary to popular belief, this engine has one spark plug per cylinder, not three. I can now loosen the many screws holding the cam cover onto the engine. With a gentle pull, the cam cover comes off the engine, revealing some mint camshafts, absolutely like brand new. I'm really pleased. They are so shiny and nice. So now I can repeat the process for the rear bank. First removing the gantry, then the collars, and then loosen all the screws and remove the cam cover. Well, that's the rear cam cover removed. And the rear cams are also in mint condition with no obvious signs of wear, so I'm really pleased with that. So now I should be able to slide out the throttle tubes. These just pull out the side of the engine. The front one comes out nice and easy, which is good. But when I came to remove the rear one, it was really stiff. I couldn't move it, barely move it at all. 
This, this explains why the throttle is sticking, I think. Anyway, I give it a gentle wiggle and a gentle pull. Eventually it comes out nicely. There's just a tiny bit of corrosion, but we can deal with that. Well, that's both the throttle tubes out. So now I need to have a bit of a tidy up and get ready for the next stage. So I'll see you all in the next video. Well, thanks for watching. I hope you enjoyed it. And in the next video, we should be all ready to remove the cylinder heads. We haven't had a lot of cold weather this year, so the hedgehogs have been coming throughout the whole winter. But we had a lot of rain, but they don't seem to mind the rain.